Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and this video is one I've been meaning to get to for a while now. More and more lately, it seems everyone's just picking my brain about ultimates in Final Fantasy XIV. Which one do I think is the best? Which one do I think is the worst? Which one do I think is the best to start with? It's not like I haven't gotten these questions before, but it's just happening a lot more now. I think some people are preparing for the inevitable wait for Dawn Trail next summer. So why not make a video on it? I don't have anything like this on my channel, so now's the time. I'll be listing all five of Final Fantasy XIV's ultimate raids and ranking them from worst to best, along with recommendations about when to tackle each one. Before I rank these ultimate raids from worst to best, however, we got another raid to talk about. Raid... Shadow Legends. All right, come on. They're sponsoring the video. I had to do it. Thanks to Raid for sponsoring the video. Raid is a mobile RPG that lets you enjoy turn-based combat and build your ideal party to tackle a multitude of challenges. Join a clan and help tackle these monstrous bosses for weekly rewards or battle opponents in the arena to see who has the best team. You can even beef up your party with a free legendary champion, Wukong. All you have to do is log in on seven different days before October 23rd, and you can add Raid's very own Monkey King to your roster. If you'd like to support the channel, click the link in the description or scan the QR code to get a starter pack and start bashing baddies today. With that, Let's get back to the video. All right, so let's start with what I think is the worst ultimate. And most people who have done all the ultimates tend to agree with this one. And that's the weapons refrain. You may hear the community call it Ultima Weapon Ultima, or you may hear them call it Uwu for short. But this one's kind of a weird one in the history of ultimates for Final Fantasy XIV. And we have a lot of insight into its development thanks to a panel that took place at one of the past fan fests. So the weapons refrain was from the beginning designed to be a streamer's ultimate. And this is from the lead developer. We're not guessing on this one. This meant that every element was meant to be kind of part of a collective surprise and discovery experience. This was especially true of the hidden Awoken mechanic, which left players stumped for the first day or so. Unfortunately, the mystery's been unraveled for a long time now, there's guides on the internet, and even within just like a month of this coming out, it was kind of just ripped to shreds once all of this stuff was uncovered. Titan and the Ultima Weapon mechanics definitely still require a good amount of coordination and prog. It's not like the whole fight is free, but it really just feels like a slight step above Savage now instead of this like grand ultimate experience. It has the vibe of ultimate, but I think once you've cleared it and then compared it to other ultimates yourself, you'd probably join in thinking that, yeah, you know, I kind of get what people say when they say this is like Savage Plus. I mean, even the actual fight design is a little disjointed. Garuda is woken so late that it almost doesn't matter at all. Whereas you're supposed to wake a primal early in its phase, and then it's supposed to change the entire rest of the phase, like add things on. And that was part of that initial kind of streamer experience. You know, we'd go through it doing the fights normally, and then we'd learn about this awoken thing. And then we'd realize we have to do things very different in order to accommodate for those change mechanics. But for the Garuda phase, that never really needed to happen. This wasn't intended. The lead developer said you're supposed to wake Garuda early like all the other primals. But they also said they're not going to change it. You know, this was their mistake. The community figured out this way to do it that involves waking it late. And they're not going to punish players for figuring that out, even on such a high-end encounter. Now, I know it sounds like I'm being largely negative, but don't get me wrong. All of the phases here and the encounter itself, they all have their own merits. You know, Garuda's debuffs hold value for the entire rest of the fight, which even added a little bit to that streamer's ultimate kind of thing, where we'd get to a really late part in the fight, realize we needed the debuffs from phase one, and maybe have to go back and change some things. And that's kind of like the core is things early affecting things later and needing to figure out all of those different elements, even if that's not really that important anymore. If it has the neat element of the nail's death order determining the dash order later, and you can make adjustments on the fly if one dies too early or one dies too late and the orders change. And it really helps if you have players who understand the mechanics and the spacing, and you grow to really appreciate those people who take the extra work to understand that mechanic in particular. And then Titan's execution on waking him and then even just surviving that phase is just a really good executional phase. Then the Limit Break Intermission acts as both a good show, it's something that feels really epic and awesome even to this day, and it also acts as this like moment to recompose before you get to that final phase. And that's really valuable when you're progging, to have some low stress moments where you just can go like, just breathe in, breathe out, focus on what you need to do. And then Ultima, I actually love the first half of the final phase. 
because there's a lot of uptime mechanics while dealing with the different primals, so much so that Ultimate Annihilation is one of my favorite mechanics in all of the Ultimates. Not the favorite, but one of the favorites. So it's unfortunate that it's landed in this fight that I don't think has aged well. All in all, it's a fight that was torn to shreds before the gear outscaled it, and that's only gotten worse and worse over time as job changes have made it even more just kind of steamrolly outside of a few particular elements, and the gear now sinks down to the point where we just roll over everything. That being said, it's still very mechanically sound. It's a great step up over Savage for someone looking to get into Ultimates for the first time. And so while I might think it's the worst because I'm a masochist, I do recommend it for your first Ultimate. And I do think you will have fun with it. And even though I've talked about it being just kind of Savage Plus, don't let that discourage you from saying, oh, I have cleared an Ultimate. Because at the end of the day, it is an Ultimate for a reason. And you should feel proud of that accomplishment regardless of what you hear longtime veterans say. All right. Fourth place might be a little controversial, but I think that was bound to happen with Ultimates because there's a lot of very, very varied opinions, especially regarding the Endwalker Ultimates. For my fourth place, I have Dragon Song's Reprise. This was the one that was released in 6.1, but was originally supposed to release back in 5.5. This is one of those placements that's really based on my personal bias. In my honest opinion, I think it's ridiculous to claim that this is fourth place. Like I would disagree with myself if not for my own personal bias. But when I put all five of them in front of me, this just, I typed this without even thinking. I was just like, that's going there. And so now I have to explain why. It's fair to say that Dragon Song's Reprise encapsulates the term ultimate. I actually think maybe the best of all five of them, but it comes with so many hills and valleys that give this fight sort of a weird feeling and flow. I mean, you have phase zero, which the fact that I have to say that is ridiculous, which just feels like a time waster every time you have to do it. I mean, mechanically, it's sound, it's not that long, and it does teach you somewhat of an important thing or two for later, but like any door boss, it just wears its welcome out so quickly, and I'm already so tired of door bosses and Savage, did you think I was going to give this one points in ultimate for it? No. However, it did make for the funny thing of after every phase in Prague being like, so there's another checkpoint, right? Please let there be another checkpoint <laughs> just to relieve our suffering. It never happens. Then you have phase one, which is also mechanically sound, but much like uh, another fight on this list, it's very frustrating to do repeatedly. Like when you wipe on it or you wipe on a phase after and you come back to it. You know, Ultima's first phase, going back to the only other one that's on this list so far, it's not totally free and it is super important to the rest of the fight, but repeating it feels really smooth and it's not really obtrusive to the progression of the fight. This one demands significantly more from the players, which can make learning the fight weary, especially when it comes to the meteor section. It's one of those things where once you know what to do, it's really not that bad to repeat, but you never look forward to doing it, and you're never kind of okay that you're doing it again. You just wish you didn't have to do it at all. And that's not really great, not a great thing to say about any part of any fight in any encounter. Then you got phase two, which honestly, executional masterpiece. So much so that it's really the true gate for most parties looking to progress into the later parts. Getting through this consistently is, in my opinion, even more important than phase one. It's just, it's really good. I, I can't knock this phase in any capacity. The next several phases, however, are kind of <laughs> snoozeville. Again, they're not free by any measure, but eyes and the time rewind and even the first mechanic in Thornton 2, it's just kind of a giant low point in the middle, and it doesn't really feel like you have time to recompose, like I mentioned with the lower point in Ultima, because you have to be doing a lot of very specific things very accurately to ensure you do them successfully. But they don't feel fun, they're not very engaging, and it takes up just such a huge chunk of time in the fight that you just, you wish you could just get to the next thing that's actually important. Fortunately, everything after that is kind of on the quality of phase two. It's all really good. All the way until the end cutscene, and that is another high point. They did this kind of storybook thing with this, where it's retelling the story from a different, you know, potential timeline of what would have happened. And thematically, that all works really well. The music's on point. They make sure to go through so many different musical pieces, and Heaven's Word is chock full of them. So presentation, aesthetics, you know, all of these things, I can't knock it for, but all of the Ultimates do these things really, really well. So I'm also not gonna give it that many points over everything else. But really, the exhaustion just weighs on the mind and soul. Almost everyone I know gets exhausted 
thinking about this fight. And not to mention, that's going to be because of the length. I mean, with phase zero included, you are looking at 22 minutes of fighting. Now, you don't have to repeat phase zero more than once an instance, but it's still there. And I think that really pushes the boundaries of too much, even with that first initial checkpoint. And it's not even just the length that's exhausting. It's the number of phases that they force you through in such a small period of time. I mean, there's, what, seven phases that we officially label as phases. Realistically, you could probably combine like eyes into Nidhogg and not call that phase three and time rewind is so short that, you know, like this, this phases we call phases, but are they really phases? You know what I mean? But like with phase zero added in, that's still eight and almost none of them reuse mechanics or don't reuse enough of them to be significant. So you're constantly on this relearning process where none of your knowledge transfers from phase to phase. And that's something that Ultima did insanely well. And something I think Every other ultimate does better than DSR. So it just makes it even more exhausting. I mean, it just comes down to all of that. Between the hills and the exhaustion, it's, it's not something I ever look forward to revisiting. That's not to say I don't appreciate the elements that do work, but I, I just can't have fun playing this. And at the end of the day, I'm playing a game. Yes, it's supposed to be challenging. It's even supposed to be frustrating given what it is but you should have fun doing it. And if you don't have fun, then you don't do it. So it's really hard for me to rank this any higher objectively when I subjectively don't like doing it. <laughs> um, honestly, you could probably stick this at number three as well, but it, I know you gotta probably stop talking about this one and start talking about number three because I got a lot of similar things to say about that one. So number three, I'm sure most of you figured this out and we're probably surprised it wasn't number four. The Omega Protocol. Now, similar to Dragon Song Reprise, I actually really like this ultimate, at least on paper. Thematically, I love that every single phase is Omega. Yeah, I wanted them initially to use some of the other Final Fantasy bosses. They were really fan y there, but they were a big part of Omega's actual plotline at the beginning of the Omega story, but this one really focuses on the tail end of Omega himself as a character. But Omega is one of the most iconic bosses in all of Final Fantasy history. He is the quintessential definition of super boss in the franchise, and that feels well represented here when he's the only boss the entire time. Not to mention the mechanics are all fast paced, they possess tons of possible permutations for players to keep up with, and they just kind of flow from one to the next. That was the thing I loved the most, is I got 10, 11, 12 minutes into this fight when I was progging it, and honestly, it felt like five or six minutes because of the way everything is condensed. So that's a great thing because in such a long fight, you really don't want to feel like you're actually in there for 20 minutes. If you can feel like you're in there for 15 instead of 20, that's a big win. Now, that's a lot of praise, but the reason it's not ranked closer to the first is similar to DSR. It, it is the exhaustion still. If anything, I think a lot of people would say the exhaustion here is 10 times worse than Dragon Song Reprise because the mental fortitude to track all of those possible permutations of every single mechanic means there is literally never a point where you get to take a break until right before the final phase. Even when you've done a mechanic a billion times, it's second nature. You're bored of seeing it. You can't relax. You have to be fully focused because you could get any permutation and any other person can make a mistake and you may need to adjust and there's all sorts of little things that could happen, but... It just, that kind of just sucks a lot of the fun out of it. Even if you are individually enjoying it, you're going to have people who aren't on the same level as you. Not everybody's going to be learning at the same pace. Some people may learn faster. Some people may learn slower. And when you have disjointed paces in a fight that is so dependent on individual execution and understanding, it gets frustrating. It gets tiring. It just you, what you think as an individual no longer matters because what you do as an individual, while important, is is not that important. It's like you still need all seven other people to perfectly understand it. You'll get more tired of phase one than any other ultimate. You'll get tired of wipes in more spots than any other ultimate with this one. And it just wears on the player so much. It was also buggy on release, significantly so, but I don't knock many points for that now. Heck, DSR had bugs on release that were really bad, and it actually, DSR still has an insane bug where if you jump with the AoE marker in phase one, it works later too, but the phase one one's more important. It like delays the hit from the AoE, 
And then everybody moves in to do the next mechanic and it murders them there. I can't believe that still survived up to this point, but it's definitely still there. I think it's fair to say that Dragon Song, given my description of this, probably should rank as number three and not number four. Um, and for for me, though, again, because I put number four as such a personal bias, this one wins just because of the little things. It's just a few small things push this one over the edge for me. But they are pretty equal, I think, in quality and in execution. But in terms of both of them, when you should do Dragon Song or Omega, they should be the last two you do but in any order. Most people would probably say do Omega last after you've done every other ultimate. I think it's fine to do it before DSR, but it, th these two definitely save until you've done the other three. Then we come to number two, where I don't have nearly as much negative to say, and that is the unending coil of Bahamut. This was the first ever ultimate, technically. Some people would say, hey, why isn't Brute Justice Savage on this list? Really our first ultimate, if you think about it. And then you could go back further to second coil Savage. But hey, anyway, back on track. This is the first ultimate, and in my opinion, the gold standard for ultimate. Despite us outscaling it, this is one that almost any ultimate raider jumps at the opportunity to re-clear. Got all their weapons already? Don't care. Want to help. Help a new raider clear it for the first time? It just doesn't matter. People are excited to do this, myself included, and that says a lot, especially after describing the last two entries on this list. Phase one is a simple phase without a lot of thrills, but that makes it less frustrating to redo after a wipe. Phase two is executionally sound with lots of little moving parts that most people tend to find fun. Phase three is the classic trio phase where Bahamut and the phase one and two bosses all team up to perform several different patterns of attacks. The amount of time the boss is untargetable is super lame, my least favorite thing of UCOB. But it's fairly paced and it's easy to track mental checkpoints for progress, which doesn't ever make you feel really that tired. You just kind of acknowledge that you've seen up to a point and that's it. You don't have to really worry too much outside of maybe doing it for too many hours in an individual day. But that's going to happen with pretty much any activity. Then phase four is the phase one and two bosses at the same time. And it's a great phase. Probably the best phase of the entire fight. Things can go really, really poorly, really, really quickly. But it's just about paying attention to those cast bars, paying attention to the role play that comes out of nail, making sure the tank swaps are on point, making sure the healing's on point, the mid is on point. It just asks for all of the most basic things out of your team, but elevated to a level that matches the term ultimate. And I really like it for that. I think most people would agree that this is probably both the hardest phase and the best phase of the entire fight. Then you've got the final phase, which transitioning into it is a mwah, beautiful, beautiful thing. It was beautiful when we first saw it. It's still beautiful to this day. But the final phase, while it has tons of gravitas and weight behind what's happening and the music and the, the just golden Bahamut just blasting everyone in the face for massive damage, it has been super outscaled by gear. In almost every way, I mean, sometimes people just spam tank LB1 for all of the biggest hits. You have tank invulns to get through all of the biggest tank hits. You know, you can get through most of them with that and then just mitt one or two. It, it's just lost a lot of that power, but it can still go poorly. You could still wipe on it if enough people die because you are dependent on this double damage buff to do it successfully. But I mean, that's kind of just encapsulates the whole fight. Like, we have outscaled this fight so much to the point it's ridiculous. We've, we've outscaled this fight so much that Death Cobb is a thing. That's a community challenge where players try to die as much as possible and still clear. And in case you're wondering, that number is over 100 deaths, I believe, last I checked. So... Very, very forgiving on the actual amount of uh, living required to do it. Now, you still need all eight players for a lot of the mechanics, but it, realistically, you could just kill people between mechanics, and it's never a problem. So, yeah. Despite that, though, it's so fun that people would go into it and try to die. Like, that's another way of enjoying it. That's not even suffering. And that kind of leans into one thing I've really come to love about you, Cobb. All of the most important mechanical elements are still intact. It's hard enough that it's super satisfying to clear, but with things like Death Cobb happening, 
it's not that stressful to progress through. It is a largely consistent difficulty and its length while on the longer side doesn't actually feel super long. It doesn't drag on. <laughs> uh, with all that together, it's just not hard to give it second place. I would recommend doing it either first or second. Ultima is the easiest one to get into at first, but if someone offers to take you through UCOB first or to put a party together, or you just want to try it first, this one's also perfectly reasonable and I think we'll be more likely to get you hooked on the idea of doing the other ultimates. And then we take first place and I'm kind of shocked. My number one is the Epic of Alexander. I didn't see this coming. I really thought it was gonna be UCOB, but you know, in the last year or so, I've come to the realization that I think this is the best ultimate at this moment. I have to be very clear about that. Uh, this is a stark difference from my on-content opinion. I mean, the fight's missing so many iconic elements from the Alexander raids, and the fight has some really inconsistent difficulty bumps and hills and valleys, but none of them are really boring, like I described the, the midway point of DSR. None of them are really that frustrating, like I mentioned some of the stuff in top. So it ends up just being really fun. And like UCOB, it's aged in such a way where all of the most important elements are present, each acts as a satisfying checkpoint for your progress, but it's not so stressful that you don't have fun. You can mess around, you can joke around, you know, quiet down for some more serious moments or if people are screwing up, but it doesn't have to be a really kind of rough environment. Whereas top and DSR, when your morale drops in those fights, nobody wants to be there. That just doesn't really happen with you, Cobb and Alexander. The main reason why I put it above the unending coil, though, is because as of now, it's a little bit better scaled with gear. Like, we, there's no death Xander. I don't think there is at the very least. Uh, and so with that, more of its elements are preserved, but the really hardcore groups can kind of push the envelope on that. And we'll talk about that in a second. So phase one and two are honestly the toughest parts of the whole fight, living liquid and then the BJCC phase. You'll wipe to random doll crits. You'll wipe the tanks being, you know, slightly too squishy for one hit and they won't know why. There'll be limit cut memes. There'll be bad Nisi passes, mishandled water and lightning debuffs, etc., etc. There's tons of things that can just ruin your day in a literal instant. But every element requires a lot of satisfying coordination and careful planning, even with the gear we currently have. There is a strategy to blitz the first phase so quick that you don't even have to worry about dolls very much. You just have to supermit one attack. And that may become more prominent in Dawn Trail. That would definitely affect this rating if in Dawn Trail it becomes community standard to do doll skip unless you're trying to like force somebody to learn a lesson as you're prog progressing them through the fight. I I'll worry about that then, but for now that's not a problem. For most groups, you know, PF standard is to do the fight as normal and that is where it shines. Then phase three is a welcome spectacle with some really fun dances, especially Wormhole. It's sometimes stated to be the hardest mechanic, but I'd say it's just one of the more punishing mechanics. It's very similar to many of the Omega Protocol's mechanics with, you know, lots of possible permutations, but it's just one mechanic. It's crazy to think Wormhole was once considered one of the hardest mechanics in the game. Now, honestly, phase two top party synergy, it's kind of like the same difficulty as this, in my opinion. So I don't really know what else to say. It kind of takes a lot of the weight off Wormhole, but it's still a really good prog point. It's still something you'll feel really good to get through the first time. And uh, it's a great learning experience. So it you know gets a lot of points for that, even so late into the fight. And the final phase isn't too tough either. It serves as one final nerve check. You know, you have things like ordained stillness and you have the alpha and beta mechanics as well. But the last couple of minutes are almost entirely free. It's just a quick, you know, don't choke, you know, make sure you move out of the AOEs, tanks properly mitigate, and that you just pump DPS for that last little bit. And it's still exhilarating through all of that. It captures some of the elements that make Golden Bahamut at the end of UCOB very fun with that last little stretch, but also captures some of the elements that I actually complimented on Ultima Weapon and then also even the final phases of DSR on top. Uh, it's It's got like a really cool thematic thing and also had that kind of Awoken style element where you needed to do something in phase three in order to even be allowed to do the mechanics in phase four. That made it kind of a spectacle to do on prog, so it gave it that extra streamer status without actually compromising the fight long term. That's a really impressive thing because I didn't think that would be possible after Awoken. But it is, because it's just not 
that drastically different of an encounter as you go through, and that discovery process isn't as important as just performing the mechanic as a whole, which does somewhat change, it's a tiny bit, going into phase three, doing that first trio mechanic. So yeah, um, I just have compliments across the board and it's valleys aren't super low, it's peaks aren't super high, they're just there. And what ends up happening is because they're not so drastically different, you don't have these long, boring stretches. If anything, the most boring stretch is also the coolest thing transitioning into the final phase where you get a giant robot transformation. All your cooldowns reset, then you go to town until you get ordained stillness first, then you cry. But yeah, no, that's why I have this at the top. And I hope that doesn't change because it's kind of, it's not the new gold standard for ultimates. I still think Yukob owns that, but it is the gold standard of how an ultimate should feel after a period of time, as more things come out, as more elements of the game are added. You know, Yukob, I didn't even mention, suffers from only being level 70. Uwu does too, but it's another stain in Yukob that pushed it a little bit down on this list. Whereas Epic of Alexander is 80, and thus works a little bit better. When we get a new level cap, though, that could change. Level 80 could not feel good, but level 70 could still feel worse. So there's all these little elements we don't fully know or understand yet, and it's why longtime Ultimate players kind of want them to re-up the old ultimates, rescale them, re-release them at a higher level to preserve some of that difficulty. And that would also affect the rankings because then I wouldn't be able to use that in this. So, so many different things. It's a very interesting topic and I'm glad that I was able to engage with you in it, even in this style of video. But that's, that's it. You have it. Epic of Alexander is my number one ranked ultimate. And to one last thing, I almost forgot to mention, when should you do Epic of Alexander? I'd say third third after doing Yukob and Uwu, because if you do Epic of Alexander and go back and do Yukob and Uwu, doing the level 80 and going down to 70, you're not going to like that. I mean, you're not going to like doing the 90s and going back down to the 80s. It's another reason to do DSR and top at the end. So yeah, yeah, it's probably best you do it after Yukob or Uwu. At least do one of those first and then do uh, Epic of Alexander or do both. But yeah, that's it's somewhere smack dab in the middle. Yeah, that's going to be a wrap for my video ranking Final Fantasy XIV's Ultimate Raids from worst to best. Thank you for watching. And again, thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring. Be sure to check the link in the description as that directly supports the channel. Literally click that link, do what it says to do, and you are good. To, mm. But yeah, that's going to be a wrap for my video ranking Final Fantasy XIV's Ultimate Raids from worst to best. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. Thank you again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring. And again, if you want to support the channel, be sure to check out that link. If you get to level 5, it directly supports the channel. So it's just a quick way to show your appreciation for videos like this one. If not, though, totally understand. Just be sure to give me a comment in the description giving me your rankings of the Ultimates. Whether or not you've done them, I suppose. Anyway, with that, I'll see you all in the next video. And until then, take care.